Hello everybody and welcome to my channel. Welcome to another full tutorial and this one is going to be a bit of a challenge so if you're up to it I encourage you to give it a go. I promise it looks a little bit more intimidating than it really is and I'm going to walk you through everything in this tutorial and the drawing template will be available for you and for at least the first 24 hours after I post this video, this template is free for you to download and print. You can get that for free on my Gumroad page. If it's after that first 24 hours or so, it is only going to be about $3.50 or maybe less depending on if there is a sale going on in my shop, which right now there is. So you can grab that and use that to transfer onto your own paper. I'll actually be demonstrating in this tutorial how I do the transfer, although I'll talk about different ways that you can do that if you don't have transfer paper, which is what I typically use. So. Also, I want to give a few notes about the actual drawing that you do for watercolors. And this is just kind of in general. This isn't necessarily specific to this composition, but it's something that I think is important, especially if you are using one of my templates, because sometimes when I do the templates, I add a few more details to the template than I have in my original sketch and it just occurred to me that maybe I need to address why I do that and kind of how to use those templates. So in watercolor, especially if you're going for a really loose impressionist look, you don't necessarily want to go overboard with your drawing. In fact, right now I'm doing my sketch on a piece of computer paper and not on my watercolor paper like I typically do because this composition is a little bit more complex and I need to do a little bit of troubleshooting with it. I'm going to do my drawing on this paper so I don't end up with a lot of unnecessary scratch marks on my watercolor paper. And that general principle goes for the templates too. So sometimes on the templates you'll see that I've included some lines just to show the general direction and shape of the feathers, for example. And that's not because you should transfer those lines onto your actual watercolor paper. That's basically just to give you a little bit more of a sense of the direction of the strokes, but I would encourage you not to include those lines on your watercolor paper because it's just a little too much and especially when we're doing something soft and subtle like feathers or fur, we don't want to have any hard lines showing through our delicate watercolor. So just keep that in mind if you are using my templates. There might be a little bit more visual information on there than you really need. And for this sketch, I'm really doing a lot more drawing than I typically do for my watercolors when I draw directly onto my watercolor paper because I just am trying to kind of figure things out. Uh, this composition is something that I'm creating from multiple photo references and those are all going to be linked below so you can check those out if you want. Uh, it's coming from mostly one of the references which you will clearly see if you check those out. And actually here let me show you what these photo references look like in the corner of this video. Okay, so you can see that the composition that I'm mostly referring to is in the top right hand corner, but then I'm looking at individual animals from some of these other references just because I didn't completely love the entire composition of the chickens in that photo reference that I'm mostly using here. So I wanted to add a more prominent rooster and I wanted to give the chickens a little bit more variety in the way that they are sitting. And basically my idea for this composition was to kind of have this morning gang all together. I really wanted to set the scene for it to be like an early morning sunrise on a farm and so I did change up a little bit of the lighting in this composition as well. And that is the main reason why I'm going to do a color study in a little bit after I finish this sketch because I wanted to work through any problems and challenges that I might have 
in that process and I'm of course going to make tons and tons of mistakes and do things I really don't like and so it's always best to give yourself the opportunity to make those mistakes and not to ruin a really good sheet of watercolor paper. So I'll do my color study on a piece of paper that isn't 100% cotton paper. And if you hear my dog snoring in the background, that's because it's late at night and they are sleeping. So I apologize for that. I know out of context that might sound a little bit weird. So anyway, I'm also changing the color of these animals a little bit. And I just want to have variety between all of them. I wanted each of them to be a little bit different. And I also wanted to think about their color in relation to the background behind them. So some of the hens that are in front of the red barn, they are going to be kind of red and yellow, but I wanted to make sure that they would still stand out from the background. The rooster is going to be white. He's kind of the center of attention in this composition. And I also changed the composition just a little bit regarding the barn. So I switched that open door with the dark entry so that it would just be right behind the rooster and really creating a lot of contrast there so that he would be a nice focal point for this composition while everything else is a little bit more muted and in the mid-tone range. So here is me starting my color study. This is Fabriano paper but it's only 25% cotton. It's not nearly as absorbent as 100% cotton paper. This is kind of the paper that I'm actually really mostly used to working with, although since I started using the 100% cotton paper, I'm completely hooked. I absolutely love it. It is better 100%, but I have a ton of this paper. So I like it for some things, like if I'm doing a painting where there isn't going to be a lot of wet into wet, this is an okay paper. It does have a really nice texture to it and it's nice and thick. It's good in every way, it's just not nearly as absorbent as the 100% cotton paper. But it's good enough for a color study, and as I said, I'm going to switch up the colors for this composition just a little bit. I really wanted to create a sense of early morning, and I'm gonna have a little bit of sky peeking through on the right-hand side where you can see, and it's just going to basically be a really bright yellow sky. And I also needed to be able to model my chickens and rooster in a way that would make sense with the lighting because the photo references I'm using are not necessarily all in the same lighting as one another and they're not necessarily being kind of backlit the way that I want them to be in this composition. So the color study is just to kind of work through any issues, see how these colors are going to work together. So you can see now that I am transferring my sketch onto my watercolor paper. And so when I talk about using a template and using that to transfer the drawing to your paper, this is kind of what I mean. I'm using transfer paper, also known as graphite paper. It's very inexpensive, it's easy, you use it over and over and over again, and it's really great. So this is a red transfer paper. I just started using this instead of black because I like having a red drawing for my watercolors. I think it's a little bit less conspicuous. And when you use the black transfer paper and it's brand new, you'll get a really dark line even when you don't feel like you're applying very much pressure. So I find that this is a much lighter line and it just makes the painting look a little bit more painterly rather than having an obvious drawing underneath it. I'm using a very limited palette for both the color study and the final painting. I'm only going to be using a lemon yellow which I'm going to place on my palette right here next to my yellow ochre. So lemon yellow, yellow ochre, Pearl Red and Payne's Gray. Those are going to be the only colors that I use. The Lemon Yellow, I'm only going to use it here in the sky. I'm not really going to use that anywhere else because I wanted to create a really strong sense of light. And in order to do that, I needed to be a little reserved with that color. So just a light wash of that Lemon Yellow for the sky will do. And then I'm going in with the yellow ochre everywhere else, trying to just block in 
everything that is going to be bathed in sunlight. And I'm working very quickly on this color study. Again, this is not something that I need to look good at all. It just helps me to identify any particular challenges that I'm going to have in the final composition. And it allows me to just start thinking through that ahead of time. I ultimately want to keep the background very soft, so lots and lots of washes back there and letting the edges merge into each other as much as possible. And I also want to create some sense of depth and lighting. So what I'm gonna try to do is I'm going to try to have the barn feel like it's getting more sun toward that far end and a little bit more shadow as it moves a little bit closer to us. So that's why I'm going over that part with some Payne's Gray. I'm mostly going to be using my Payne's Gray to help me define my shadow areas, anything that is occluded from the light. So the side of the fence that the chickens are on facing the viewer, that of course is going to be in shadow the haystack that's right next to these chickens is going to be in shadow and i'm not sure how i felt about this haystack ultimately i left it in for the final composition because i didn't want it just to be a fence and i thought it was nice to have that little bit of organic structure off to that side of things but ultimately i'm not sure how i felt about that maybe should have just left it out it was something in the original photo reference that i kind of liked but eh not not super happy how it turned out. I don't know. I guess the jury's still out on that. And I just finished doing this, so sometimes it's really hard to judge your own work, especially right after you get done. I'm a big believer in taking some time away from your painting after you finish it and not judging it until you come back to it with fresh eyes and a fresh perspective on things. So I'm also using the Payne's Gray to block in where the chickens are away from the light. So the parts of the chickens that are a little bit more occluded from the light, just trying to keep things very light, of course, because the chickens ultimately are going to be much lighter in value than their surroundings. And that is the contrast that I need so that they don't just start blending in with the background. And the way that I'm going to approach the shadows for each individual animal is really going to vary depending on their coloration. So right now, because this is just the color study, I'm using a lot of Payne's Gray on all of the chickens and they're not really going to look super different from one another in this rendition. But ultimately what I'll do is I'll use Payne's Gray and I'll mix that with other colors to create just a darker version of the base color of each bird. And when I'm doing the color study too, the colors that I'm using for these birds will end up getting switched a little bit. So they won't be quite what I'm working on right here. And that's another benefit of doing a color study because as much as you can plan things out in your head and think through a lot, you're never going to think through everything and you're going to see things that aren't quite working out the way that you want them to. And so it's nice to have this kind of trial run, especially when it's a little bit more of a complex scene. So just about done with this color study, keeping it very simple. Some of the things I identified in here that I really didn't like was that I used way too much red pigment over on the left on the barn. So you can see that that's just way too strong. I need to keep the background much softer. All right, so I'm just hanging this on the wall behind my little setup here, getting my sketch back down to transfer. This is actually my final watercolor paper. And it in this video, it looks like I'm just blowing through this whole thing, but I really wasn't. I got up and walked away stretched my legs and came back. I didn't sit here the whole time and just kind of blow through this whole thing. So I know videos sometimes can make it look like that is what is going on, but truly it is not.
So I'm just doing the transfer process again. This time I'm using a colored pencil to apply pressure to my template to transfer the lines. And the benefit of doing that is that you can see where you have marked over the template. If you're just going over it with a pencil, you won't necessarily see that you've already gone over some area or maybe that you've missed another area. So for the final transfer here, I felt like it was worthwhile just to use the colored pencil and not get things confused. And again, I'm only transferring the most primary lines on to my paper. Not every single mark, not all the shading or anything like that that I did on the sketch. So let's just finish up this transfer really quick so we can get to the fun painting parts as my dogs snore in the background. All right, so here it is. I know you can't see it very well. I'm going over with that same colored pencil, reinforcing just a few of the more important lines, especially the lines that I know are going to be in shadow a little bit more. So you'll see that I'm not completely outlining each bird, but basically just the portions of the bird that are more in shadow. I'm doing this mostly just to give me a little bit more of a visual aid as I go. And as long as I have some of the lines, I can figure out the other lines, even if they get lost in the paint. So I'm using these more bold marks a little bit more sparingly. I really don't mind having a little sense of a drawing showing through the watercolor. I just don't want it to be super prominent. I don't want it to really look like it's like a coloring page or something like that. So I try to keep my lines pretty open and I'm not going to reinforce the lines in the background because I really want to make an effort in this final painting for the background to be really faded and soft, except where that open door is. So there's gonna be a little bit of a dark spot around the head of the rooster. And for my final painting, I am going to use just a little bit of masking fluid, and I'm only going to apply this in areas where I want to preserve just a tiny bit of white on the chickens because we're really getting somewhat of a backlighting situation here because the rising sun is behind them and I want to preserve a sense of things glowing and as I do my initial washes I don't want to have to worry about avoiding these areas in order to preserve these whites. So I'm going to apply masking fluid to portions of the tail feathers, portions of the bodies of the bird that are getting direct light just on the rim of the form. All right, so we've got that finished up and I did leave this to dry. It's really important to let your masking fluid be 100% dry before you apply any paint so that you don't risk getting any wet masking fluid on your paint brushes. I never apply masking fluid with any kind of brush, not even like a cheap throwaway brush. I don't wanna to have to rebuy brushes all the time because they're destroyed with masking fluid. So I use silicone applicators and there is a link to all of the watercolor supplies that I typically use. If you look in my description a little ways down, it's just an Amazon link that's just an easy place to make lists, but these are all materials that you can buy from any art supplier. So I'm going to first wet my entire paper. You see a little bit of a pink tint. That's probably just because there's a little bit of pigment in the bristles of my brush. I'm not going to let that bother me one little bit. Going in with my very light lemon yellow on the sky. And as I said before, this is going to be the only place that I used this lemon yellow. This is also sometimes called a sunshine yellow because it feels so much like a bright sun. And it's something that I love to use, especially in areas that really need to be bright. And you can see how different it is from the yellow ochre that's directly to the right of this yellow on my palette. It almost makes that yellow ochre look like an earthy orange color. And I did kind of splash that lemon yellow all over the place. It really will kind of dissipate over time. But just to create 
some unification between the sunlight in the sky and then the sunlight hitting especially the birds I did kind of splash that around just a little bit and it'll give a nice subtle effect now I'm going in with my yellow ochre to other areas that are very warm but maybe a little bit more earthy so this haystack the top rim of the fence posts is going to have a lot of yellow ochre in it and then portions of the bird that are not getting quite as much direct sunlight but still a little bit of sunlight I'll use this yellow ochre. The yellow ochre will also create a really nice base for a couple of these birds. The bird on the far left is going to be kind of a reddish orange rusty color and then the chicken right next to that, sorry that's my dog, is going to be more of a warm yellowish orange color and again the rooster is going to be white and then the hen on the far right is going to be kind of spotted gray so this yellow ochre does kind of create a really nice base for most of these birds even the white rooster because the parts of him that are in direct sunlight I want those to read very warm while the shadows will contrast that having a lot more of a cool undertone and I have a little hair on my paper that was bugging me but I couldn't get it off without using my nails so I'm just gonna let it sit there until everything dries I'm using my Payne's gray now on the side of the barn that is getting the least amount of light. So this looks very dark right now but you'll see that as it dries it is going to fade a little bit and become a little bit softer. I'm doing a little negative painting just around the form of the birds as I need to. Now all of this paper is wet and so there is going to be a little bit of bleeding especially into the chicken on the far left but don't let that bother you don't let it discourage you it's something that I've learned over time just to really appreciate about watercolor some of those you know as Bob Ross would say happy little accidents where you didn't really mean for it to happen but at this stage in the painting it's really not that big of a deal especially if you're applying your color very much diluted and watery so you'll get a little bit of merging not a big deal it'll actually make things just look a little bit more natural and soft in the end because we'll be able to go back in and further define that space both behind the bird and in the form of the bird itself and then I'm blocking in the fence posts with just some Payne's gray leaving that top edge of the fence post yellow ochre because that's going to be receiving a lot of sunlight With watercolor, I've learned that, especially in the beginning stages of a painting, defining just where the light and shadow is, is so much more important than the colors that you're using. So in the beginning, don't feel restrained by trying to mix a particular color that you actually see in your reference or, you know, what you think should be there. Because at this point, we're kind of, it's almost just a mental exercise where we're blocking in the light and the shadow and we're finding that immediate pattern so we can start to see that emerge here this is almost a value study between the Payne's gray and the yellows at this stage and I'm starting to use that Payne's gray very lightly on the birds especially on the side of the birds that is occluded from the light just to start to build up some sense of shadow there so that we, again, have that contrast between light and shadow. I'm not worrying about anything else. I'm not worrying about what color these chickens will ultimately be because that is something that will get worked out after this stage, especially in the final stage where we are applying a lot of the texture. So let's just think of this initial stage as a very loose value study, even though we're not going in with any dark values at this point, just kind of starting to mask off some of the general areas that are getting at least a little bit less light than other areas. 
Now I'm going in with a very light wash of my Purell Red, and right now I'm blocking in these distant trees. These are just going to be a relatively flat block of trees with just a little bit of texture at the top to indicate a sense of them being trees. And they are not going to be defined in any way. There's not going to be any like leaf texture or anything like that. They're almost just a very light silhouette. And if you think to sunsets where the sun is rising behind some dark object, especially like a tree where some of the light is actually getting through the tree. And it's not a dark silhouette. It's not a black silhouette. It almost just becomes like a somewhat of a, I don't want to say glow. I'm not really sure the word to describe this, but it's just not like a stark solid silhouette. There's lots of light filtering through. And that's what I'm going to try to capture with these distant trees. So going in at first with red, but then I'll go in a little bit later with my Payne's gray very lightly. So I'm going to keep those distant trees very light. And now I'm moving right into the red portions of the barn and there's no need or reason to distinguish this red barn from that red block of trees in the distance. And I used my paper towel there just to pick up a little of that paint because I want a window right there to be reflecting that yellow sky. So I needed to make sure that that stayed a little bit lighter. And again, even though I know there's going to be a window there and I kind of loosely drew it in when I did my transfer, I'm not really worried with maintaining a rectangle shape right there at all because I'm going to form that or at least give it a little bit of a suggestion using a little bit darker paint later when I start going in to define some of the forms. But again, I want the background to really remain very loose. And I wasn't even really sure how to handle some of the ground peeking through the fence post, so I'm just going to leave that area pretty general, not trying to define anything. I think ultimately I'm imagining, just as in the photo reference, that it's just some hay back there, but it's so unimportant that I'm not even going to really worry about adding much texture back there to indicate that. I did add a little bit of a red glaze to the haystack, leaving just a little bit of yellow poking through where I'm imagining there's more light catching. And again, ultimately, I don't know that I would really include this haystack in this composition, so that's a choice that you can make. I put it in mine, and actually I might just crop it out after the fact. We'll see. That's just the beauty of being an artist and being able to make those decisions. So luckily it's off to the side. So I'm not stuck with it if I end up not liking it. So at this point I'm kind of just standing back looking at it and trying to be decisive about what to do next. I am painting on a watercolor block. So these are sheets of paper that are glued together around the edges. The nice thing about working on a watercolor block rather than having my watercolor sheet taped to my desk is that I can rotate it like this and it just gives me a little bit more access to some of these areas that are a little bit more delicate. I'm using my Payne's Gray with just a little bit of my Purell Red in there to start doing some negative painting around the head of the rooster. This is that open barn door so it's just basically going to be dark in there. Going in with a fairly dark wash, although a little bit later after this dries, I'll go in with some even darker paint to give a little bit more dimension to this area so it's not flat. But right now I just want to kind of block this in very loosely and just maintain those edges around the head of the rooster. And remember, I did use some masking fluid, but I didn't use masking fluid in a way that I would completely block out the form of the birds. So the areas around like his beak and his crest, those are not blocked or masked out at all. Now I'm adding a little bit more Purell Red to that same mix that has the Payne's Gray in it. And this is where I'm going to start to block in the darker side of the barn. So the side of the barn that's 
a little bit further away from the light source. It shouldn't be a huge difference between these two areas. They are essentially on the same plane, kind of perpendicular, I guess, to the sun. But I'm just imagining that this side that's a little closer to the viewer is just a little bit, not necessarily dark, but maybe just receiving a little bit less light. So the undertone of the side of the barn further away that's getting more light had a lot of yellow in it, and then the undertone for this side of the barn has a lot more of the Payne's gray in it. And I remember from doing my color study that I did accidentally go into this area with way too strong of the red, and my Pyrrole red pigment is just extremely strong, and so it's really easy to overdo it if you're not careful. I can pick up just a, what I think is a little bit of that Pyrrole Red, put it down, and all of a sudden it's just all over the place. And that's something that can be remedied, but ultimately it's good just to kind of anticipate that and to be kind of careful. And now I'm doing a little bit of negative painting around this part of the barn door this open barn door where there's kind of a crisscross of white boards and even though the boards are white and they appear very white in the photo reference because I want this area to look a little bit darker I'm making sure just to think about not what the local color is the local color of course being white is you know the color that those boards were painted but since they're a little bit further away from the light, I didn't want them to be stark white, and that's why I blocked those in with the Payne's Gray. And now with this little light wash of the Pyrrole Red, I can bring those forms out. And I'm not going to spend much time at all in this area of the painting. Again, have to always remind myself that this part of the painting, the background, I really want it to not be distracting from the primary subject, which are the birds. So here's just a little bit more Payne's Gray, and this is where I'm going to glaze over these trees. They're pretty well dry at this point. So this straight edge here is the top of the fence that is behind this pen. And then I'm going over with this very light glaze of Payne's Gray, allowing some of that red to show through because that gives a little bit better sense of dimension and filtered light. And then these more narrow strokes are defining in between the fence posts. And I realized that I had gone maybe a little bit too far. I had sketched in a vertical post between the barn and these horizontal posts. Ultimately, I think I decided just to leave that out because I already went over that area with the Payne's gray and the red <laughs> on the trees. So it wasn't really that important, but I kind of caught myself maybe just a little bit too late. Going in with a little bit darker Payne's Gray and those trees, and now you can see that it really helps to create a sense of illumination back there. That slight contrast between the sky and the tree line really helps, and I didn't have to go all the way to like a black value. This is more like a dark gray value. And letting some of that red peek through I really think helps to give a nice sense of filtered light. And here I'm just picking up a little bit. I felt like maybe it was just a little too dark. And it also gives a subtle sense of texture without overdoing it and over rendering those trees back there. Again, my dogs are snoring in the background. Sometimes my microphone is able to filter those things out and sometimes not. And I can't really tell until I listen back to this. So I apologize once again if you didn't hear me apologize before. Okay, so going in with a little bit more saturated, more pigment of the Payne's Gray, just in this area immediately behind the rooster, but I'm not going to completely cover this open door area with this darker value because I want to give a little subtle sense of variation and I think it gives a better sense of depth if you don't go in with just like a flat dark wash. So kind of just right toward the bottom of the door, going up just a little ways, it helps to add some contrast between the rooster and that background, but it's not completely flat. So you can see that I left some of that medium dark gray showing through. I 
adding a little water, a little bit of red. I kind of go back and forth with my mixes, and since this palette is very, very limited, ultimately it's really just three colors because I only use that lemon yellow in one area of the painting. All the rest of this painting will only be three colors, so the yellow ochre, pearl red, and Payne's gray. So I'm constantly kind of just going back and forth with those colors, shifting my mixes depending on the temperature that I want my color to be. So I'm kind of thinking in terms of lights and, or I'm sorry, cools and warms rather than specific colors. And I think that one of the great things about using a limited palette is that it helps you to really explore that whole concept of color temperature because you're no longer going to be trying to match specific colors that you see in your photo reference, which is something that I really encourage people not to do anyway because photographs have all sorts of problems with them. They really flatten things and... Uh, you get lots of blown out spaces, a lot of like pure black spaces that just you wouldn't see that in nature. So I try to rely on my experience from doing plein air paintings to think about what the light would actually be doing. So I'm not just copying the photo reference, but using a limited palette really helps you to move past trying to copy colors and start thinking about color in terms of temperature because that can be very effective rather than trying to, you know, mix a, an orange or a green or a violet. Start thinking of things as warm and cool neutrals. And using a limited palette is very helpful with that, especially if it's kind of non-traditional colors like what I'm using. So not just your stereotypical yellow, blue, and red, but you know, different versions of those primaries can be very effective. So I'm adding a little bit of texture here to this haystack. Ultimately, I'm going to go in with some flat washes a little bit later on just because I am trying to keep in mind the composition and where I want the eye of the viewer to go. So I don't want there to be a lot of activity going on in this really non-essential, unimportant area of the painting. And so I will end up going in and kind of flattening this a little bit because there's just a little too much texture in here at this point. At this point, I'm finished with the background for the most part. There's a few small adjustments to make. And also my phone pooped out on me at this point and stopped. So you can see I made a little bit of progress here before I noticed that my phone was no longer in commission. Uh, but let me just quickly tell you some of the things that I did. So you can see that I started blocking in the two chickens over to the left, just started adding like their base layers. So if you think back to my tutorials on the hen and the rooster, I always establish a base layer that I can build my texture on. So I think about what is the primary color of this subject and how can I capture that in the simplest way possible so that when I add texture on top, it all feels very cohesive. So the roost, or the chicken over on the far left, I wanted that to be a little bit more of like a rusty red color. And then this hen in the center, um, center left, I guess, is more of a yellow orange. And so that's how I blocked her in, and she has some gray in her tail feathers. Some other things that I did, you can see that now I've defined the window. And all I've done with the window is I used some of my Pearl Red and Payne's Gray, very light actually, very relatively light wash, just to add a little bit of definition to some of the boards around that window. And now it really reads like a window. Um, I also did the same thing with some of the vertical boards or siding of the barn. So you can just see some very subtle indication of vertical lines in the barn. Those are also very light. Those are basically just Pearl Red, but I kept them very, very light so that they wouldn't be too stark. I didn't want to add too much contrast there. And I think that's about all that I did while my camera was off. That's just one of the bad things about trying to make these videos with my phone. Because if sometimes if I get like a text message or something, it'll stop recording, but not always. 
sometimes there's just no rhyme or reason and it's sitting up way above me so I have no way of knowing until I actually just go up and, and check and look. So I've moved on to the rooster. I'm basically going to do a first pass over all of the birds just to establish their base color. For the rooster, remember, he is going to remain white. And so the areas in shadow I need to handle pretty delicately. And I'm just using some very light washes of Payne's Gray to start building up some value in the areas of the rooster that are further away from the light source. I think that I end up going maybe a little bit too dark in the shadows here. Not at this point, but a little bit later I'll go maybe I think a little too dark. So that's something to keep in mind. If I had, if I were going to redo this painting again, which I don't think I will, um, I would probably try to keep that area a little bit lighter because the entire rooster is white. That's his local color. But then the way that the light is hitting him, I knew that I wanted the tail feathers to be catching the most direct light and then the front of the rooster would be a little further away from the light, a little bit occluded. But because he's white, even his shadow areas probably won't be super dark because there's still going to be light bouncing off of his environment and bouncing back onto him. So this isn't a situation, again, just like with the trees, there's not going to be like a really stark silhouette happening anywhere in this painting. The darkest area of the painting, of course, is just that open door going into the barn. So I'm also using very light, subtle washes to begin to define his feathers. Again, because his local color is white, I have to be really careful that when I start to delineate some of the directional strokes that indicate the feathers, I don't want to go in with a really dark color and then it looks like a line. I want everything to look very soft and subtle. And so that's why I'm keeping these very, very light, even though I'm working on the shadows. And I also need to consider the physical reality of these animals. So working on the front of the bird, there's more of a mass there. So there's more light that can be occluded, but when I start to delineate some of the feathers in the tail, I need to be even more subtle with the shadow value that I apply there because light can filter through those thin feathers. And that's why they look like they're so illuminated because there's going to be a lot of light filtering through them. I'm starting now just to block in the crest keeping it very light. What I learned again from doing my rooster painting the other day was that I went overboard on the red in the crest and that made it more difficult to add a sense of form in that area. So this time I was really careful to make sure that it stayed very light. This hen that I'm starting to do the block in I think this was actually the most challenging hen because the photo reference that I was looking at for this hen was kind of a spotted gray hen. So she had a lot of little spots all over her and she's very muted in color, kind of gray, but almost a warm gray. So I'm trying to use these three colors. So just the yellow ochre, pearl red, and Payne's gray to define some very subtle grays and some color shifts in this bird. Oh, and I also need to mention at this point, I forgot that when my camera turned off, I had actually removed all of the masking fluid from this painting too. So there is no masking fluid on these birds at this point. Once I finished the background and I didn't have to worry so much about, you know, disturbing those pure whites with some of the washes I was applying to the background. I removed all that masking fluid because now what I have are a lot of really stark whites and I'm going to need to soften those up. So I always mask out a little bit more than I really intend to because it's always better to preserve more whites and then you can go in and adjust those areas than to not preserve enough because then you won't be able to get those whites back. So I've removed the masking fluid and then as I'm doing these block ins, I'm creating those subtle transitions between some of the lighter areas that are getting a little bit more shade and then the bright white areas that I really ultimately want to keep to a minimum so that they're very effective. Less is always more when it comes to doing light 
like having highlights and sometimes lowlights as well, but definitely highlights less is more. So with this bird over on the right, I am doing my block in with her a little bit differently because I'm starting to block in some sense of these spots. So I'll do more texture later, but I wanted to go ahead and get that started because she is so complex in her markings. And I'm kind of moving from left to right on these birds, so as I finish one bird and move on to the next, then the previous birds are going to have a little bit of time to dry so that when I go back in, either to do a little bit of glazing or to do some dry brush to add texture, those areas have time to dry so that I won't get areas that are actually unintentionally soft. With watercolor, you can end up with unintentional hard lines and also unintentional softness. So it's good to, you know, as you get more familiar with this medium and how it works and how you can really use its properties to your advantage, that's a big one. So don't spend all your time trying to completely finish one area of the painting. Kind of move around the painting in ways that make sense so that you are allowing drying time to areas that need to dry a little bit and you don't ever have to necessarily stop working all together. So now I'm going in, there's more Payne's Gray and Pearl Red here. The wash is still relatively light and I'm not doing dry brush at this point, however, you can see that the way I'm putting my strokes down is more of like a hatching motion. This I think is a little bit too dark what I'm mixing here. I don't want to go from these kind of light medium values to super dark. So maybe just, I guess, if I use this sparingly, it won't be too bad. And plus some of this area that I just laid down is still a little bit wet. So this darker mix will just kind of merge into it. But you want to shift your values subtly, especially if you're painting a subject that you want to retain a sense of softness. Adding a little bit more Payne's Gray here. There's not much water on my brush at this point, although I'm not doing dry brush. Again, I'm not blotting my brush off onto my paper towel, which is off screen right now, by the way. But there's not much water in my brush, and so I have quite a bit of control over the markings that I'm making right now. And these darker marks that I'm making on each bird, they have to make sense going along with the undertones of the bird or the base color of the bird. So for this one, because remember I wanted this to be kind of a rusty red chicken, uh, that's what I'm mixing up essentially to do some of the texture and details. It's pure red and Payne's gray, which gives it a little bit of a nice rusty look. And my paint mixture is just a little bit more saturated, less water, a little bit more pigment, not going overboard and taking it too dark, too fast, and subtly building up a sense of texture and dimension into this bird. And then when I move on to the next, you'll see that I mix these darker values a little bit differently so that it goes along with the base color of the bird. And now I'm starting just to define some of the features around the face. For these chickens, even though I'm working on a much larger format today, I had done my other tutorials on 5 by 7 blocks of watercolor paper. And this is a 9 by 12 because I wanted to have all these birds in there. And I did want to get a, at least a little bit into the details. And so I wanted to give myself plenty of space to do that. So I decided to do a larger format. Um... But even though I'm working on a larger format, I don't necessarily want to go in and overkill the details in the birds because I want to retain a sense of the watercolor property in this painting. I don't want it to be too tight. My personal goal is always to try to loosen up a little bit because that's really not in my nature. And that's what I love about watercolor so much is that it challenges me to loosen up. And I can definitely see the progression over the last several years 
of my watercolors being really tight and not really looking like watercolors and I still have a lot of work to do in loosening up but I do feel like I'm making progress toward that goal. So even though I'm working on a larger sheet of paper and I could really go in here and put my nose up to it and do a lot of detail work, I'm basically just trying to give a sense of texture and dimension to the birds and I also want them to be distinguished from the background. So the background, remember, I, I intentionally left that a little bit softer and more muted. And so I need to have at least some contrast between that background and the birds so that they are very clearly the focal point of this painting. But I'm not going in and trying to paint the individual shapes of feathers that I can see, just really using some short hatching marks without much water on my brush to create a sense of texture. And then I use just a little bit of Payne's Gray to mark in where the eye will be on that bird. Adding a little bit more red to the crest. I don't need the crest to be really bright red and actually I had gone over that area. Some of the Payne's Gray from that initial wash that I did on the background bled into that and so I'm not going to get like a really pure bright red but I also don't really need it so I think that it ends up working and helping everything to feel a little bit more natural. So now I'm just kind of looking and trying to decide how I'm going to address this bird that I want to be a little bit more yellow orange. So ultimately I took some yellow ochre, mixed it in with that pile over on the left which was a little bit of Payne's Gray and a little bit of Pure Red. And so you can see it's just a little bit darker than the pure yellow ochre over to the right because again I want to keep these value shifts pretty subtle. And now I'm going to start to define some of the feathers that again are a little further away from the light source. As we get closer to the light source those feathers really need to remain undefined because I want that sense of light. Sometimes in a painting, you're going to spend more time defining the light areas of the painting, and sometimes you're actually going to define the shadowy parts of the subject. And that's something that I think that you kind of just learn to distinguish when you need to do either one of those things. So. In this case, because we have a backlighting situation, in order to get that strong sense of light, we need to leave the areas in direct light. We need to leave those very simple and undefined. And then we can do a little bit more of our subtle defining within the shadow areas, especially because the shadows are not super dark in this painting. So I'm gonna spend most of my time working on the feathers that are further away from the light source and then leaving areas of each bird that are closer to the light source very, very simple, not doing much in there at all. And you can see that this way of very subtly building these values is very effective, especially in this bird. And then for the gray tail feathers, I just went in with some very light Payne's Gray, not pure Payne's Gray because I didn't want to shift that too cool in temperature because that would be too much of a contrast in temperature from the rest of the bird. So there is some yellow ochre in that Payne's Gray. And then a little bit more Payne's Gray and yellow ochre to start to define the base of the bird that is occluding the most light. And a few of the tail feathers that are further away from the light source as well. And I want to keep this yellow ochre a little bit more pure, blotted it off on my paper towel as you can see so I get a little bit more of a dry brush. And then I can apply this just to a few sparing areas a little bit closer to the head. This bird was a little bit tricky because she is actually being most occluded from the light than any other chicken because she is being blocked by the rooster. So I really didn't need to keep any pure white in her it when it really makes sense because she's not really receiving any direct light. And then I'm going to mark in her very small crest. 
leaving her head relatively simple. And I'm mostly finished with her. I will just give her a little bit more of a once over to see if there's any area that needs to be further defined before I move on to the rooster. So as you can see, again, I'm working from the birds left to right, allowing that base layer to completely dry before I come back in with the values that will define the feathers and some of the dry brush and you know the texture that I ultimately want them to have and because there are so many of them I don't need to overdo any of the details because they all kind of come together and they just make sense as they are and that's one thing too that I love about watercolor and maybe art in general and something that I've learned is that you really have to start to appreciate the fact that the viewer can make sense out of relatively little information and sometimes paintings are more interesting to look at when they have a little bit less information in them and the viewer can kind of put that together themselves. When you spell everything out and try to define everything, it almost becomes uninteresting to look at because there's nothing that makes it different from everyday life if it's too realistic. So that's something I have to work on. I'm again, I'm getting better about that, and that's kind of what I want to pass on to anyone else who is exploring this medium or really any medium, because I've really gotten into impressionism over the last couple of years and trying to really define for myself what makes that style of painting so intriguing to me and also to so many other people. And that's kind of the main takeaway that I have so far is that as people, as intelligent people, we really like to look at art and be able to figure things out ourselves. We like to be intrigued by how everything comes together to make sense, even when we can get close up and see every individual messy brush stroke that the artist put down. I'm definitely not into photorealism, but... Growing up and doing drawings, my goal, of course, was always to make the most realistic drawings that I possibly could, and painting has kind of taught me to get away from that a little bit. Okay, so this is important. Look at the rooster right now. I'm defining the bottom of edge of his wing. I wish I had just left it right here. I think that I add a lot more value down in there, but I think that at this point it actually looks really good. It is making sense with the fact that the local color of the rooster is white. I have enough value there to give him form, but for some reason I felt like his wing needed to be defined even more, and so I know that I go in with even more value. See right here what I'm doing. I'm, I think that I'm adding way too much dark value that was unnecessary. And, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. And this is the good thing, of course, about doing the color study because I made way more mistakes doing that color study than I'm making in this, but I'm still going to make mistakes and that's okay. Going back and watching and thinking through things and seeing myself in action is actually really helpful to me, to be quite honest, because it helps me to analyze my own, you know, style of working, my own workflow and where I tend to maybe overthink things. So it's good to be reflective, not in a, you know, negative way where, you know, I don't like myself because I love to paint and I love exploring and I love learning. So that's how I always approach self-criticism from a point of, you know, I love painting, it makes me happy and I want to get better at it. So I do a little bit of self-critique all the time and it really does help. So again, with these tail feathers, I have to be really, really careful not to apply too much value. If you look at my palette where I'm getting the color from to do this, it almost looks like there's really no paint in there at all. But there is definitely enough to help delineate just a few of these feathers, doing most of that delineation toward the base of the tail, because that area, of course, will be a little bit more occluded from light than the end of the tail feathers. And here I go back in. Ah, uh, why? Adding more value under that wing. 
Oh my goodness, guys. <laughs> so just leave it if you're doing this. Oh, it's just way too dark. Okay, so I'm over it. And again, my advice and what I try to follow myself is that when it comes to really light values, less is more. Don't overdo it. Don't feel like you have to go to a certain degree of darkness in your values. Sometimes that just doesn't make any sense. And in the case of this rooster, these darker values don't really make sense. So, and then there's some of these tail feathers that are kind of flopped over and I want to be pretty subtle with those. I can go with the value a little bit um, a little bit stronger just because they are further away from the light. I really want the tail feathers that are standing up to be catching the most light. So I'll keep those values very, very light and keep my strokes really simple as well. And then I'm going to define some of the features around his head just a little bit more. There's his eye finally. And now I'm going back into this other chicken. She already had an eye, but I just decided to make it a little bit darker. And same over here on the left. Just adding a few more strokes, being a little bit nitpicky. That's something also I have to work on. Okay, so let's go back in and just finish up this rooster guy and then move on to the last chicken. Again, just kind of being a little bit nitpicky here, a little bit ridiculous, not making any huge changes, but seeing if I can bring out some of those values a little bit more while still keeping it very subtle. Going in with more of the very light Payne's gray just to add some of these features I'm seeing around his head. And now I'm ready to move on to the last chicken, which was the most challenging one. And again, I want to retain a nice sense of subdued, muted colors while also giving an impression of some of the spots. And her markings were really interesting and beautiful because it was almost like a necklace around her head. They weren't all over her body. So I'm mixing in some Pure Red and Payne's Gray. There was also a little bit of yellow ochre in there. So this is a very nice, warm neutral. There's lots of red, lots of yellow ochre. And so this is how I'm going to build up, at least initially, some of the areas of this bird that are in shadow. With a very light touch though, of course. And remember, I had some masking fluid right on her head. And so there's lots of kind of awkward, hard edges there. And so I'm bringing in some of these strokes into the head area just to help merge the markings in with the lighter area of her head without it being too stark. And then the front of the bird's body is going to be the darkest area, both because of the markings and also because that area is more in shadow. So I'm just going in with some nice brush strokes that are separated from each other. Not much water on my brush and lots of pigment so that these are really dark. And these are those dark spotted markings that are around her neck that I kind of think of as kind of a necklace. The hardest part too about this bird is that her head is turned a little bit. And so I need to address that area in a way that gives a little bit of form but keeps it very simple and light too. Right now her head is just a little bit too stark and that makes it appear very flat. So I'll have to build up those values very very subtly and gradually. And adding some of the markings right around her beak and her eye do help a little bit with that form as well. And we're just about finished with this project. Um, I know this was a lot. This is a really big project. It's a little bit more complex. It's probably one of the bigger projects that I'll post, at least for now. Sometimes doing the simpler ones, I think, is not only more efficient, but also makes a little bit more sense because we can talk about one technique at a time or one concept at a time. But I thought, you know, after doing the hen and the rooster, I wanted to kind of bring the chickens all together 
and create this morning crew. All we need is a cup of coffee, and this is like the perfect morning in my opinion, just hanging out with the chickens. So this is kind of a capstone to my chicken theme, although I'm going to be doing more chickens. I have to admit, I've been just like addicted to looking at photo references of chickens, and next time I go out to my parents' farm, I'm going to try to take some of my own photos of the chickens. But after this one, we're going to go back to some more simple compositions, which will feature ducks. So I'm going to go on a little bit of a duck kick next. All right, so I'm adding a little bit more value to this gray spotted chicken, and she's starting to come together. Her head is still looking maybe a little bit flat. I didn't want to overdo that area, although thinking back, again, kind of being analytical, her head is the furthest part of her body from the source of light, so I really should have just gone over that area maybe a little bit darker. I was concerned about losing her head because there's a lot of foreshortening going on with that bird, and we're not really seeing her from a profile view like we are with the other one, so they're a little bit more easy to define than this one, who we have a little bit of foreshortening going on with. But I really like how her markings turned out, left her tail feathers, which were white, very simple, didn't do much in that area at all. Going into her beak just to make it a little bit brighter yellow, and I might touch up some of these other beaks a little bit too, although it's not going to make much of a difference at this point. Also applying just a little bit of yellow ochre in between some of the darker spots and on her tail feathers just a little bit. That's really all the value that I need in the tail feathers. And now I'm trying to soften up that area right around her head so there isn't such a stark, hard line between her head and the rest of her body. Adding a little bit more value down to the base of her body. And I'm pretty happy with her at this point. I'm going to go in with a little bit stronger red on her crest and some of the other crests of the other chickens and birds as well, just to bring those out a little bit more. The hens, of course, have much smaller crests than the rooster. And I'm not going to completely cover up those crests, just adding a few areas of accent with this really bright red. brightening up each one of those kind of a final touch for this painting except I'm going to do a little bit of fiddling in with the ground and went back to my large brush let's grab some yellow here this is that lemon yellow I guess I went back to that just to add a maybe trying to go for like a sense of sunlight on the rim of this haystack right here again not totally in love with this haystack I think at this point, there's just too much texture there, so I think I go back in there and kind of try to flatten that out a little bit. And I'm adding a little bit more value also to the ground behind the fence post because I think that maybe I went a little too dark with the fence posts, and so I don't want so much contrast, and, and the ground I left it almost like pure orange, just yellow ochre and red. So I wanted to subdue that a little bit. So I went over it with just a little bit of Payne's gray. Doesn't make a huge difference at this point and I don't want to take that value down too much and lose the fence. Getting a little bit more Payne's gray here and now I'm trying to flatten out at least the corner of this haystack a little bit so that it's not so distracting. And so it's a little bit darker in value and occluded from the light. And like I said, when I'm all finished with this, if I want to crop this a little bit, right now it's 9 by 12, I could probably crop it down to an 8 by 10 size and everything would maybe come together a little bit. I'll lose some of the sky, unfortunately. I really like the sky, but I probably don't need such a large block for the sky anyway. So I could probably do a little bit of cropping, along the right side and the bottom of this composition and it'll look probably pretty good at that point. So 
all finished with this tutorial. I hope that you enjoyed it. I know this was a long one and there was a lot to it. So, you know, feel free, you know, when you're watching this to kind of pause it, try some things and come back to it if you need to. And remember, for the first 24 hours of this video being posted on the internet, the template is available to you for free on my Gumroad page. And if you can't get it for free, go to my Etsy page because I often have a sale running there so you can get a discount. And right now I do have a sale on my Etsy page. So there's always links in the description for materials that I use and tips and, you know, unique supplies that I find along the way. I like to share the sources for those. Hope you enjoyed this and have a great day.